The topic is going to be super resolution. What you see here in the first panel is basically what you would see through a conventional fluorescence microscope. And then the next two panels show ways in which that fluorescence image is then processed to give you enormous amounts finer detail through this process of super resolution, which is a, a, a catch-all term for a lot of materials. And there have been basically two major approaches to uh, super resolution, but in all cases, it turns out, they depend on two kinds of phenomena. Let's start with what the challenge is. You re may, may remember that the diffraction limit was set by Abbe, was determined by Abbe to be roughly, is roughly more or less half the wavelength of light. There are people that argue about whether it's half or a third or two thirds, but that's not critical. And we've already discovered, discussed at least one or two of the ways people have approached this. One was to use shorter wavelength light, that is to go into ultraviolet light. And the other was to use really short light, which was the electron, and build electron microscopes that do the same thing. At the same time, there are these people that have been, I don't know, challenged caught up in the idea that maybe there's a way of actually manipulating the light or manipulating something to actually overcome this wavelength list limitation. And what we're gonna talk about today are a couple of those approaches that basically work on fluorescence images and are potentially adaptable to living and moving tissues. They involve two basic kinds of approaches. One of them is this thing called single molecule localization, which I'll get to in a minute. And the other has to do as a general principle with some very interesting properties of fluorescent dyes. And we'll talk about that also when we get to it. But those are the two things that sort of underlie the uh, super resolution approaches that we've been having. So this work, remarkably enough, was recognized six years ago with a Nobel Prize. That's extraordinary. I mean, these are people who did their work roughly in the year 2000, 2006, 2010, and it was recognized with a Nobel Prize that quickly. And these are all living, vibrant, people still working very actively. Okay? So we're going to talk about the kind of work that these three people did and how it fit together into what we now think of as that super resolution approach. So these are the statements that come from the Nobel Prize web pages and the, the descriptions of, of why these awards were made. Basically, it talks about the idea that both Betzig and Myrner, working separately, set up the basis for single molecule microscopy. And that's the one we're going to talk of first, which is a method that relies on the possibility of turning fluorescence of individual molecules on and off, or at least looking at something that happens as a small number of molecules become fluorescent at a time. Then, the other system is this thing called stimulated emission depletion, STED, which is, is kind of interesting because what you see in the public literature, in the more popular literature about this, ignores the STED phenomenon in a funny kind of way. And it turns out that this invention or this discovery of the process by Stefan Hell is the key to that. 
So we'll get to the stead system as we go along. There are, a, there's one other technique that we're going to talk about, which is also one I had mentioned in the syllabus, which is this thing called SIM, uh, structured illumination microscopy. And we're going to talk about it a little bit. Part of the reason I think that it wasn't nominated for this same Nobel Prize, twofold, I guess. One of them is that they only give out the Nobel Prize to three people and they had to choose. The other is that the man most responsible for it, a man named, man named Mats Gustafsson, unfortunately died before that award was made. And the Nobel Prize is made to living people. So that created another problem. So let me move on and, and start addressing this issue of single molecule localization. This is the approach that one refers to as stochastic, in which what you do is you randomly activate one or another fluorochrome and then look for individual molecules that are fluorescent. So let me fill in this line. Okay. To isolate individual, not people, but molecules. Okay. And that's what we're going to talk about first. The second is this STED system and others that use manipulation of light. I'll mention that there's a whole set of resources that I've listed up here. The set from the FSU EDU or microscopy.com are all part of this microscopy website, it was taken over both by Zeiss and this is Olympus that runs microscopy. No, it's Nikon, sorry, that runs microscopy U. They've both refined and improved their systems quite a bit, except their old websites, even the newest ones. And they use, I'm afraid, animations that use flash. You may be aware that flash animations were a great animating system developed by Adobe at one point, but Adobe decided because it was probably too vulnerable to hacking that they were going to discontinue flash and they did so without providing a reasonable alternative. So a lot of the flash uh, animations and things that were developed in flash are no longer visible. You can't use them, which is a disadvantage. And if you go and look at these particular sort of sites, you'll come across a flash animation and you'll get a message that says, please upload the most recent flash program, and it turns out there is none. So that, that's a real problem. But nevertheless, there's a lot of written information on all of these sites that will help quite a bit to work out some of the details if you're trying to make sense out of this field, okay? Then, sorry, this is slightly confused, but there's an enormous number of acronyms that have been developed. It's a sort of an alphabet soup because each one of these things was developed by a separate lab taken over by a separate microscope company. And they're all in competition with each other. So it, it's a little maddening. The ones we'll talk about specifically are Palm and Storm to begin with. These are two stochastic systems. And then we'll talk about STED and SIM afterwards. So here's the idea of the way the stochastic systems work. In all cases, you still have to have fluorescent dyes that can be turned on and off, okay? So you have a fluorescent dye, you can make it fluorescent, as you know, in many cases, by flashing an excitation light on it. What's particularly interesting for a lot of these dyes, and a number of them are very special dyes, is that not only will they fluoresce when you apply the light to them, 
But if you then apply the light that they would normally emit, it sort of cancels out the fluorescence. And so they become photo switchable, if you will. You can turn them on and you can turn them off by changing the wavelengths that you use to illuminate the samples. Okay? It's an interesting possibility. So what you can do is set up a fluorescence system in which you illuminate very briefly and only see a small number of fluorescent spots as a result of very weak fluorescence. And then you give it a blast to wipe those out and then look at another set. And each time you end up trying to localize the individual fluorescent spots that you were looking for. So here's, here's a kind of a simple-minded diagram of this thing. You use a low level of light and see a small number of dots. Then you use a higher level of a different wavelength and basically you end up blanking the screen. Then you shine the excitation light again weekly on this system. And now you find different dots because the fluorescence is stochastic. That is, they, they fluoresce just as a matter of which ones pick up the photons at any particular time. And so now what you do is you, you catch, now we'll go through one more cycle. You blank it. And then once again, you get one more set, okay? Now for each of these, what you do is you take a picture of where the spots are. And then you take each of those pictures and you superimpose all of them at once. So that what you end up with is seeing all these spots superimposed into a single image. But how do you know where the spots are? That is, I showed you a spot here, these spots, but a spot like this, because of the Abbe phenomenon, because of all of the rest of the way light emerges, these things are actually fairly large. And if you wanted to know what's right next to this one, the two sources of light would overlap. And so what you need to be able to do is not only see the dot, but reduce the dot to its smallest size, to the center of the dot. And the idea here is that if you take a dot like this and do a profile, a single dot, it'll look something like this in terms of intensity. Okay. Turns out to be more or less a Gaussian. And so if you have a calculating system that can say, here's a Gaussian graph. So I'll say, look, this may have come from some sort of Gaussian curve. If this data came from a Gaussian, then I can specifically locate this central peak as being the source of that Gaussian. And so I could come up with that. So here's, here's a diagram of that sort of process. So the idea here is if you pick it up with a very sensitive camera, the very sensitive cameras tend to be quite pixelated like this. But if you look at this carefully, you can see that the bright spot, although you might say, gee, look at this, this whole central area is bright. But if we look at it carefully, what you see is that this spot over here is actually a little darker than the others, and maybe even this one, and the brightest spot might be here or here. So what you end up trying to do is to take this figure, smooth it out in some 
you know, break it up into smaller pixels, but then see if you can fit a Gaussian curve to this pattern. So you end up taking this, you start with this collection of pixels, and then you try to fit where is the true center? Is it sort of more here? That is someplace not exactly on one pixel, but partly shared between a couple of pixels. So you can get to that point with quite a bit of precision. Okay. Now, this, this idea sounds a little strange, but what I remember many years ago, a uh, developmental biologist who was holding forth, as I do, I guess, said, you know, at night, when you see a plane flying overhead, you can see its headlights. But what you see is a kind of a blur of where the headlights are, right? It's, it's a smeared out thing, which is, for instance, much larger than the headlight itself. If you were to look at the same plane in the daylight, you could barely make out where the headlight was. So that what you've got is light coming from the headlight here and spreading out in this big pattern, which is what you finally see. So once again, what you'd like to be able to do is calculate back, where does this really come from? Okay, and that's what this calculation of a Gaussian distribution does that says, let's really localize that point to this one spot. Now you do this with a whole bunch of images. So this is a, a kind of a funny way to do it. If you look this thing up, it's called um, storm. over the Eiffel Tower. Storm being a pun, because it's like the storm process for stochastic imaging, okay? So here's the idea, the history of this, is that the Eiffel Tower, this is real data, the Eiffel Tower is illuminated at night with flashing lights, okay? And so the lights flash in different patterns every couple of minutes. The lights are on, then they turn them off, and new lights come on and it flashes back and forth, okay? So here's what you can then do. Take a picture every interval whenever these things are flashing, okay? Take one, then take another, then take another. Okay. For each of the pictures, is picture one, picture two, picture three, and maybe a hundred of them, okay, depending on how, how much of a camera you have. Take each one and now recalculate in that picture the detailed location of the spots. So that means you have to take this picture and carry out a Gaussian distribution function on every one of the dots. This is done obviously by a computer system. And in the original designs of this thing, it took forever, okay? So anyway, then you take those individual dots that you have and you say, okay, now I can go back here and put that dot precisely on a certain spot of the uh, Eiffel Tower. And then if there's another dot, dot close to it, I might be able to resolve both of them at once, okay? So let me play this video and we'll see how this plays out. It goes by kind of quickly. So let me point out what's going on. Okay, so it shows the flashing. Let me back it up. 
So here's one flash. And you see, let me go even further back. Okay. So if I'm really far back, here it is, here is one moment of flash. These are the lights you captured, and you start to figure out where they're located. And so you can see this pair of lights here, which are represented in this diagram, in this part of it, right over here. But you notice there's another one as well, and maybe a couple of others. Those are from earlier iterations. So let's see if I back up even more. See, now I don't see those dots at all, but I see these other ones. These two dots are still there. And if I move forward, got to go a little more. See, those two dots are there, but they've been filled in with the data from the rest of it. Okay. So now, if I play the rest of this video, you can see that we gradually fill in all of the details that make up the full lighting structure of this tower. So this was flash and it's been rewritten in uh, the HTML5 format. And here's the same idea. So here's a blank specimen or a dark specimen. And we slowly go through this process. We activate by creating fluorescent dots. Okay, we figure out where they are. We calculate where they're located and we put them on the screen. And we do it again. And this time we get different dots, okay? Now, because I'm impatient, I'm just gonna rush this through. But what you see is happening is we're beginning to see this image of the individual filaments. And if we do enough of them, we should be able to see those filaments in quite a bit of detail. And as I suggest, you can get actually pretty impressive detail out of a storm image, okay? this kind of thing. What starts to become an interesting question is, what happens if your molecules are actually still moving? as you take this kind of process going on, that is small molecular mo motions that are going on in here, little almost Brownian vibrations. So that becomes something to consider when you do this sort of work. Initially, it took a very long time to take an image like this one and flash it, capture dots, flash it, capture dots, back and forth, back and forth, recalculating in each case what the exact position of the dots was. Okay, So it would take a couple of hours to process a single image. Okay, This process has now improved quite a bit, so it's, it's much faster. But it's still not the sort of thing you can do to see moving living tissues. Okay, This is another example of this, um, where what they've done here, just for the fun of it, or for not fun, for demonstration, this is from the original paper in which they described the use of the palm system. And what they've done is they've taken the original micrographs here, and shown what happens when they use the palm system to improve the resolution. We get this. And then just as a kind of a show of, of the power of this thing, 
they actually compared this elongated structure, which is a mitochondrion, to a sectioned mitochondrion in the same tissue from, in fact, the same slice. And then they show that you can superimpose them. Okay. It's really kind of a tour de force, but it's a, it's a very nice example of the kind of additional resolution you get comparing what's in A to something that you can now start localizing and thinking of in terms of the electron microscope. So that's, that's the palm storm stochastic system. The next one I wanna talk about is this thing basically called STED, stimulated emission depletion. This was developed by Stefan Hell. So it's sort of an interesting pun since the German word Hell means bright. Okay? But at any rate, uh, Stefan Hell put, is the one that came up with the idea of this STED system. And he based it on a fluorescence model that he called RISOLFT, which is reversible saturable optical fluorescence transitions. And let me see if I can show you a little bit more about what this involves. Back. OK, it's a little much. But it's, it's kind of a puzzle because most of the things you read about STED don't talk about this aspect, which is the key to it. So here's the key. Here's the thing. This is a fluorescence diagram of this. It's called a Jablonski diagram. And I think I've shown you some of these before, where the idea is that when you stimulate with an excitation wavelength, you stimulate some kind of fluorophore, it raises the energy up to some level of which there could be several, but it, it raises it up. And then the energy is relaxed a bit and then it drops down again, releasing fluorescence. Now, what, what Hell realized or initially hypothesized was that if you gave this another shot of excitation, so you move it stimulated even up higher, that blocks the, the normal fluorescence. And when it does come down eventually, and this is not so well diagrammed here, it comes down at a different wavelength at a much longer wavelength, okay? And this wavelength is sort of unimportant for the observation that you're doing. So the main idea of this is that you excite it, but then you give it a little extra boost and that stops it from fluorescing. And then depending on how you've set it up, it can be bleached or you can actually recover it, but at a much lower, longer wavelength. What they've done to create this microscope system, we go back here, and there's this sort of magical term here to use a donut of light, okay? Um, and let me see if I can show you something of an example. This is a little hard to see, but here's the basic idea. You start with a standard fluorescence microscope, which is this one, which you know, right? Has an excitation beam that goes down to the sample and then an emission beam that comes back up through the dichroic filter, right? So that's standard fluorescence and it looks more or less like this. But then you take, and this is the thing that's not very well explained. You take a second beam, which is the one that's used to give the, to boost up the energy. And it turns out to be the same wavelength 
as the normal fluorescence energy. Okay, they call it a depletion laser. Okay, and there's a special optical trick which is called a it's a vortex phase plate, which doesn't mean an awful lot to me, except that what it is is it changes phase as you go around this plate. And it turns out that it ends up creating a kind of a, a donut shaped light source. So there's a little hole in the middle and it's, it's a donut, okay? And so what happens is you project that onto the sample here it is. And what that does is it blocks a whole bunch of the side light. That is the, the it's not scattered, but the, the light that's off to the edges from this fluorescence. And you end up seeing fluorescence only from this little spot, okay? And the resulting image then since this is basically just a scanning electron micro, a scanning light microscope, scanning fluorescence microscope, is that you scan the image and you see a great deal of the detail now in these structures. This is, I'm afraid, one of those animations that no longer works. But the uh, this is to give you a sense of what the beam might look like. This is the um, the donut type structure, which you see here like this, okay, surrounding the small spot in the middle. And it's a small spot because this other one is depleting, is actually inhibiting the light that's off to the edges. So this is one more example from the original paper in which they showed the power of this system. Okay. And so they are looking at an antibody that binds to a specific protein, synaptotagmin, that is part of the structure of the synaptic vesicle. And the point they want to make is that after the vesicle is released, the molecules remain attached to each other in a small cluster. So what they're showing you here is that you can see this in sort of confocal imaging of a sort, but then if you use the STED system, you can increase the resolution enormously so that now you can resolve individual particles within that cluster. And this is an enlargement over here of those particles compared to the same enlargement of the standard confocal image. Okay, and this is one more example from that paper of how powerful it can be to look at, in this case, these are, this is sort of strange because it says proteins of the nucleus which is some of that, but I think what we're really looking at may be nuclear pores, this structure here, okay? Okay, then just for a couple of minutes, last couple of minutes to talk about this structured illumination system. And this involves some image processing that we haven't had time to go through. But the basic idea of it is if you take, and again, this I'm afraid is one of those animations that won't work. Uh, if you take a sample and you superimpose on it a lighting system, let's see if I can throw it in a simple way. Here's a sample. Here's a sample with some sort of detail in it, okay? Now, that detail may be a, a bit blurred, and so you can't see the whole thing. Well, it turns out that what you can do, 
And this is this process that uh, Matt Gustafson developed. Um, you can superimpose, instead of doing ordinary kinds of curler illumination or standard wide field illumination of the sample, what you do is you illuminate it with this um, pattern that's going like this. That's the picture that you see here, okay? Then you rotate that pattern. I'm not sure I can actually pull this off, but let's give it a shot. Ah. Rotate the pattern and do it again. And then rotate the pattern some more and do it again. This is all very confusing in terms of you trying to see what's going on. But the idea is that what you've done is you've taken this original image, which I'll go back to here. And you've sort of gone across it in one direction, around the other direction, and created a kind of a, a matrix of what amounts to all the background information, because the sample itself remains constant in this. And so if you can extract all of that background that you've superimposed, you can clean up the background, the image itself. Zeiss originally put this into an instrument that he called the apotome, the he, that they called the apotome for sort of standard structured illumination microscopy. And then it was modified theoretically and in practical terms by Gustafsson to do it at much, much higher resolution. And the what's high resolution becomes this pattern is of the order of wavelengths of light that's superimposed on the sample. So it's a much higher resolution way of trying to isolate the information content as it is. So that's as much as I want to present on super resolution.